you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Oh, I've been waiting for this one for a very long time. Remember the Aston Martin V12 Vanquish fondly for two reasons. Firstly, it and the Jaguar XKR were just about the only good things about the Bond movie Die Another Day. Secondly, on my walk to school as a very impressionable 14 or 15 year old, there was a chap who lived down a little alley that we used to cut through who had one of these. They were still in production at the time and every single day I saw it, I had to take a moment to look at it just a little bit. In the intervening years, I've been fortunate enough to drive many, many Astons and liked nearly all of them. Yet this one has escaped me. And it turns out that the Vanquish is actually one of the most important Aston Martins of all time. At the turn of the millennium, Aston Martin were not in a good place. Ford had owned the company in part from 1987 and in whole from 1993, but they had precious little to show for it. Sure, there was the DB7, which was generally quite well received and a first attempt from Aston Martin at making a genuinely affordable car for a new generation. However, there was no escaping that underneath this very beautiful exterior was a 20-year-old, slightly tweaked and reheated Jaguar XJS. It was also, rather embarrassingly, in top trim, only about £10,000 cheaper than Ferrari's all-new, all-aluminium 360 Moderna. The range-topping V8 was still in production in a number of different trims, including the legendary V600, which produced incredible power and torque figures that would still impress today, but then it should, as it cost in 2000 near a quarter of a million pounds. Clearly, something had to be done. Aston Martin needed a genuinely new car, and the Vanquish was to be it, although that name wasn't revealed until later. It was initially called Project Vantage, with Autocar dubbing it the DB12. If ever a car was going to put Aston Martin's pipe and slippers old-fashioned image to bed, it was this, because the Vanquish was as cutting edge as they came. Underneath, you had a chassis developed by Lotus who took the technology they'd been using on the Elise, bonded and riveted aluminium extrusions, and created this. They even reinforced it with several fairly large sections of carbon fibre. And if you had that on a car today, you'd be impressed, let alone 21 years ago. The original car also featured many composite panels, however the finished article has aluminium ones instead, but they were still hand-finished to make sure fitment was perfect. The main reason for this, I'm told, was lower insurance premiums because with only a few large composite sections, the car would simply be too expensive to repair in the event of an accident. The engine was essentially carried over from the DB7, but when you're talking about a quad cam 5.9 litre naturally aspirated V12, that's no bad thing. And isn't it a glorious engine to behold? There are so many little touches in this bay that just make you want to spend hours looking at it from the gorgeous carbon fibre strut brace, uh, Aston beat BMW to the punch with that one, and these little chimneys here that seem to be directed down to the manifolds, obviously allowing air to vent out of the grills in the bonnet. Less good was the gearbox Aston Martin chose to pair it with, because for the Vanquish the only transmission option was a six-speed robotized manual that was not very well loved when new and is not now. To the extent that before this car even went out of production, Aston Martin Works themselves offered a manual conversion. Bit of a shame that.
It's the looks of the original Vanquish that I've always been somewhat split about. In the flesh, it's actually a much more curvaceous and traditional looking car than some of the later ones, which are much sleeker in their profile. However, there's a couple of elements that have never quite sat right with me, and those include the admittedly very distinctive and heavily pronounced rear arch, which just seems to come out of nowhere and doesn't blend with the rest of the body. And worse than that, the indicator fog combo at the front lifted from the DB7. Even Ian Callum, who actually styled the Vanquish first time round, clearly didn't like those either, because when he came to do his second go, he got rid of them entirely. And I think what he did really shows us what we could have had if this car went on for a little longer and Aston Martin actually had any money. This car also has a special place in history as the final series production Aston Martin to come from the Newport Pagnell workshop, where it was assembled in very much the same labour-intensive method as Aston's of old. This is one reason production numbers were fairly low, because they simply couldn't make any more cars using the old methods than they already were. Though I completely understand anybody who disagrees with me on the looks of the outside of the car, the interior is the one part of the original Vanquish that rarely gets defended. Because up until the very last of line cars that got an interior much like the DB9, ah, uh, this is not so good. It is a festival of Ford parts bin, from the door handles here to the window switches to all of this infotainment here. There are still some nice touches. This leather iron ore, by the way, is absolutely beautiful. The seats look rather shapely. They're Vanquish S items, more on that later. And this car also has the optional Lynn stereo, which looks very pretty, and I'll play it later to see if it sounds just as good. I am told that when Dr Ulrich Betz joined Aston Martin in 2000, he looked at one of the prototypes for this car. He stuck his head inside it and said, you can't be serious, that's not the interior we're going to build it with, is it? And uh, unfortunately, it was. For geeks out there, there are four buttons up here that look very much like the arrangement in modern cars. In the centre, you've got the start button, nice glass, very beautiful. But the ones surrounding it are WSP, that's Wheel Spin Prevention, that's for driving in the snow. You've got a Sport Mode that I'm told doesn't seem to do all that much. ASM will get the car to shift gears on its own, and I'm told not to use that. And the final one is Reverse, fairly self-explanatory. The Vanquish also has generally useless back seats and a boot that is far smaller than you might reasonably expect in a car that was designed as a GT and that when new cost £160,000. Today, an early example would set you back around 55 to 60 grand, with the later, more desirable Vanquish S being priced at around 120 for the good examples. Those feature a number of changes over the earlier cars, including some cosmetic tweaks and a performance boost too. So they make 520 horsepower rather than the earlier 460. The handling and gearbox are also both improved and they are all round, apparently, a much better and more desirable car. There was, however, one car oft forgotten that went between the Vanquish and Vanquish S. This. This is a Vanquish SDP, the Sports Dynamic Pack. Think of it essentially as a dry run for the Vanquish S. So it got many of that car's handling upgrades, but not the extra power or cosmetic enhancements. You've got beautiful SDP-specific lightweight aluminium wheels, which I rather like. You've also got a faster steering rack, bigger, beefier brakes, and a slightly lower and more robust suspension setup too. This is also extremely rare. Fewer than 2,600 Vanquish were ever made. Around 1,000 of those were the later Vanquish S, but only 94 of these were ever sold. And I'd forgive you for not realising it was ever available at all, because it was on sale for only five months. This car has a particularly colourful history. It was originally the Vanquish SDP press car, so it could be seen with its original number plate in many magazine articles from the time. It's actually been driven by Andrew Frankel twice and was the car he first did 200 mile an hour in. This then, after it finished as a press car, became a bit of a prototype for Aston Martin, which is why it has the Vanquish S seats, and you may even spy a little attempt at building a DB9 style fold-out nav screen. That apparently was a total disaster, and when they opened it, lots and lots of polystyrene fell into the aircon system and gummed it up. For this reason, when Aston finally did put Satnav into these, it was simply in the little waterfall rather than popping out. 
After Aston Martin were done with it, it then went on to a film producer who used very creative ways of financing his films. And Frank got it after it had been seized by the liquidators, having sat in a barn for a number of years. It was then subject to a very extensive restoration project to bring it back to the condition you find it in now. And this is genuinely a concourse level car, having at one Aston Martin gathering been dubbed the most significant vanquish there. I'm very lucky to get to drive stuff like this, aren't I? The car was restored by Stratton Motor Company, who very kindly provided an extremely Aston-centric background for today. And later on in the video, I may play a game of how many Astons can you spot? It is still serviced by them, and Frank has now had it for 11 years, with absolutely no plans to part with it. And I totally understand why. Love it or loathe it, the first-generation Vanquish is an incredibly important car. It was very much the next step in Aston Martin's future and set the template really for them for the next two decades. However, being the last car assembled at Newport Pagnell, it also has a direct link with Aston Martin's heritage. There is unlikely to be anything else quite like this ever again. Time then, I suppose, to stop blathering on about it and find out if it's actually any good. Right then, for my first impressions, cards on the table. I have to confess, I'm quite rooting for the Vanquish. I want it to be a really good car. Pretty much all the Astons that came immediately after, I've really enjoyed, so I'm hopeful this is gonna live up to expectations. I have just completed the drive-bys with it, and the first thing I was surprised by is the ride quality. It's actually very good, and I don't believe this is an insult, Lotus-like. The dampers are passive, there is no sport setting for the suspension, this is it. And I've got to say, I think it's actually really rather well judged. Remember, this was the range-topping car, and the idea certainly for the Vanquish S was to make a more hardcore, sports-orientated car rather than an all-round GT, which is the role the DB9 was supposed to have. I have just manoeuvred the car to pull out of Stratton, and the gearbox actually wasn't horrendous. I have been fully briefed on how to use it, and unsurprisingly, it's much the same as many other early automated single-clutch jobs. In other words, when you're at low speeds, do lift off to help smooth the shifts out. The odd bit of advice, though, was that when you do put the car into reverse, you have to obviously be stationary and whatnot, and you've got to press the reverse button here. But the thing which surprised me was I was told, don't just stab the button down here, because it may well break. You've got to push it gently with a couple of fingers. The reason for that is simple. The clips behind are quite weak and it's a known issue with these cars. I was also told not to even bother with the automatic mode because it is absolutely atrocious, but again, no real surprises there. I don't think before today I'd actually even sat in an original Vanquish, and it's really rather an interesting place to be because it feels genuinely halfway between the later DB9, V8 Vantage, DBS, and the older DB7. You have more room, it feels like, than in the XJS-based 7, but it's not exactly spacious. The wheel and the dash here all do feel very, very close. Seat adjustment seems somewhat limited, you've got basic forward, backwards, tilt and whatnot, but I've found a fairly comfy driving position, which handily is much of the same as the owner Frank's, and they are comfortable chairs. Got a little bit of sport in them, and they feel to me a lot more natural than the later ones used in the DB9 from about 2007 onwards and in the V8 Vantage as well. I've never got on with those. Seats are a very, very personal thing. Someone pointed out to me recently, I have a very tall torso so maybe that's got something to do with it, maybe it doesn't. Who can say? Actually, the internet can say, can't it? The internet will say whatever it likes, and it'll think many, many things, but um, they're not true. I fit in a narrow-bodied caterer with tillet carbon bucket seats. If anything, I tend to have a problem with seats being too big rather than too small. Strange, but true. This car is entirely standard, including the exhaust, though it does have the valves wedged open just to give it a little bit more drama more of the time. I didn't expect this to sound like all that much, mostly because some of the reviews I'd seen, it sounded a bit flat. However, this is 
really good. The steering is a little bit slower than I expected, bearing in mind this has a quicker rack already than in the regular car. The brake pedal also takes a lot more movement than you might like to actually start to slow the car down. It's a little bit worrying the first time you try and stop this car. I have no shame whatsoever in admitting that I'm taking time to build confidence with this car for a couple of reasons. First off, it is irreplaceable. It is Frank's pride and joy, rightly so. He's poured many, many hours into making it as good as it can be. And I'm very, very grateful that someone brings out a legitimate concourse competitor for me to drive and have fun in. And he's very happy for me to have fun. The only other thing that's currently on my mind is the fact that to give me the authentic and correct experience, this car has been fitted with the original and correct spec Yokohama tyres. I'm surprised that they are actually what should be fitted to this car, but they even have the Aston Martin badging on the side. Unfortunately, they're no longer available, so the fronts on this are very old. Power is what you might describe as creamy smooth. That downshift was actually pretty good too. Yeah, you can feel the car squirming a little bit when it really shouldn't. That will be the tyres. Power is decent, but it doesn't really impress these days. Remember, 460 horsepower, and despite aluminium and carbon fibre everywhere, these weren't very light. They weigh 1.85 tonnes. That's a lot. Embarrassingly, it's also more than the Ferrari 550 and 575, which had at their core a steel chassis. Even the later Vanquish 2, which has all carbon fibre panels, wasn't really any lighter. I never quite managed to work out how it was Aston Martin managed to make these cars so heavy. Ah, clear road. Shall we give it the beans? Let's. engaged sport mode and it seems to have made one very obvious difference it has sped up oh, what the heck is going on there okay this car does not seem like it's a happy bunny to me I'm gonna take it out of sport mode uh, <clears throat> sport mode definitely speeds up the upshifts the downshifts actually were already okay and that's a surprise because I actually broke one of my own rules ahead of this video. I decided to watch a load of old reviews. I already remembered the sort of important bits, so I didn't feel like I was gonna be spoiling anything. And the complaint with regards to the gearbox seemed to be directed more towards the downshifts. Those are actually really quite good. The upshifts in non-sport mode are very slow. They are very jerky. You want sport mode, it will help you. Throttle, I think, is also a little bit sharper in sport mode too. The bit though that I actually thought would be really, really good, which I'm currently slightly disappointed with, is the steering. The weighting is nice, but it doesn't have that tactility, that texture of the later cars, which are in some cases truly brilliant. It also does not seem that keen to turn in. I figured that the extra speed of the Vanquisher steering rack would mean it's just a, a little bit more Italian in its response, but um, apparently not. The engine certainly seems flexible enough. These dials are very, very old school. You've got all the basics, nothing really fancy. The display for the gear is a little bit antiquated, I will confess, although not really dramatically different to what, say, Lamborghini had in the Murcielago SV. In fact, if you made me bet, I would say that could be the same display as you'd find in the Murcielago SV. The rev counter, the speedo, and the other dials over here are all sort of very traditional, weird, blue on white style, which just looks a bit odd. Indeed, the whole car is filled with just really interesting mixes of both space age, forward looking stuff, and then also really weird touches. So I love the little aluminium grab handles down here, less so the rubbishy infotainment. Unlike a Ferrari, you have to uh, double click to get it back into first. Right. <laughs> Thank you. 
definitely something wrong with this car. It is sort of slipping out of gear occasionally. I'm going to take it out of sport mode. Stop it doing that. The ride is definitely on the firm side, but I'd say for what this car is, it's judged really well. Visibility is also pretty decent. The windscreen feels a lot closer to you than it does in later cars. I am being very cautious on the brakes, chiefly due to those front tyres. You get a sense of a lot of mass up the front that's not particularly keen on changing direction. Even the 550 is a much more agile car. It certainly feels like it anyway. say though the engine isn't really a fireworks display like some later cars it still does the business and you can carry speed pretty well yeah ABS kicking in pretty early there those tires reach their limit pretty soon this is a really really sweet thing to drive and the thing is because it does feel like a 20 odd year old car in here I'm probably a lot more forgiving of it than I maybe should be the handling in particular is really quite off to the point that I don't feel like this is right. I'm going to feed this back to Frank when he gets in, when he next has his service, maybe just look at the Geo, and he has even told me that on the Michelin tyres he also has for it, but are on a different set of wheels, it is a much better handling car. In fairness, it does feel like a car which isn't really designed to be bounced off the limiter at every given moment. Instead, it's quite happy to be worked on the mid-range. That you probably heard there was the traction control cutting in. It shouldn't have cut in, it didn't need to cut in. It's a perfectly dry day, it's 15 degrees out there, and I wasn't giving it the beans, but the tyres have just reached their limit. Oh, that's nice though, that's really nice creaks and rattles actually surprisingly few and far between that's really very good the old wing mirrors are not particularly pretty they're nowhere near as nice as the ones on the uh, v8 vantage oh oh my buddy lorry no that's a reliant pickup wow that's fantastic let me give you some more of those sport mode downshifts because you know something the gearbox is the one bit of this car i was just assuming was going to be awful because everybody has told me how bad it is I remember very well the fifth gear review of the Vanquish S when Vicky tried to do a bit of a burnout with it and uh, the car let go twice. As it happens, it was actually Stratton Motor Company that came out and fixed the car. And from then, I always had this sort of slight concern that maybe the big Vank wasn't quite as well engineered as you might hope. That being said, if well maintained they can be fairly durable cars but as you might expect something like this the cost as much as it did and was packed with innovative for the time technology isn't a very cheap car to run things like fuel insurance and tax they're all not really big concerns what are things like rust Though the core chassis here is carbon and aluminium, the subframes are not. The undertray is aluminium, which is bad because it means it won't corrode. What it'll do is collect water and the subframe sits so close to it that it'll then just rot that through which is quite expensive. The clutch on these is notoriously tricky to get right even for an Aston Martin specialist. It's one of the most expensive clutch changes I've heard of in what you'd term a regular car. About 7,000 pounds is the figure that was quoted to me. Unfortunately, the gearbox issue I experienced in the video turned out to be the first signs of a clutch needing replacement. But this is the first time during Frank's ownership the car has actually needed one. We don't know exactly how fresh the clutch was in the car when he bought it, but we do know that while it was an Aston Press and development car, it went through at least seven of them. Most owners should get a bit more life out of theirs though. Parts availability is also now becoming a little bit tricky because these are older cars and Aston Martin aren't always the best with supporting them. 
The ECU, I'm told, is a particular concern. The right-hand one, in particular, is known to fail. Aston Martin used to offer a service where they would fix them. It wasn't cheap, it was about five grand. But now they've decided not only do they not want to fix them anymore, but because they own the intellectual property to it still, they don't want anyone else to fix them either. That's a little bit awful of you, Aston. I mean, if you're not gonna take the money for fixing them yourselves, could you not just give away the rights to it so the aftermarket can come in and keep these cars on the road because this is a really very special thing. Oh, I did play with the Lin stereo earlier. It's okay. It's nothing brilliant, nothing to write home about. Bit of a shame really because it does look amazing. Also, when you're driving, you get to appreciate a little bit more of the sculpture of that bonnet, and I'm really impressed how three-dimensional this car feels. The, the later ones are sort of dictated by almost one line, a bit like a Lamborghini, but this has got so much more about it. It does feel more like a car with a direct connection back to the 60s styling when things were really, truly elegant. I love it. Still not so keen on those fog lights and the, the rear arch is still a little bit odd looking, but the front end, that bonnet, that's beautiful. You might have also spotted this has the grille from a Vanquish S on it. That was something also fitted by the Aston factory and I think does look a little bit better. It is disappointing the car's chosen today to play silly buggers with me, but I'd say that it hasn't really interfered with things all that much, and this is genuinely a first drive of the Vanquish. I'm hoping there will be further opportunities. If you have one out there, particularly if you've got either a, a standard original car or a Vanquish S, I'd really like a go. Actually, if you've got any Aston Martin, I'd really quite like a go of it. I'm, I'm greedy like that, to be honest with you. I'm very lucky though that I have some very, very dedicated followers who are quite happy to share their passion in cars. Anyway, I think that is probably a decent enough introduction to the Aston Martin V12 Vanquish. Definitely one of the most special cars to ever come from the Aston factory and a far more complicated and nuanced machine than I probably expected. This is not a definitive verdict, but I actually kind of like the old girl. I think it does help greatly that I see it as an older car. I view this as a classic alongside stuff, say like the DB7. And if you consider this the missing link between DB7 and DB9 and not the superior car to DB9, which Aston tried to push it as, I think it probably works a lot better. To cross a continent or to hop up into Scotland in this, I think would be a joyous experience, even now. Finally, a huge, huge thank you to Frank for bringing his car out today, to you for watching, and to Stratton Motor Company for providing a backdrop to today's introduction. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I shall see you for the next one. Bye-bye.